Good morning, everyone. Oh, if only you could be as excited as I am. I hope at the end of today, you'll be as excited as I am now yeah. when yeah. that happens inside your mind. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about a subject that I am very passionate about, a subject that has captured my interest from the very beginning of my journey with the Lord. In fact, it was a subject that first caused me to read my Bible. This was the subject, and that subject is wisdom. My very first time that I can remember, I want to read the Bible, like for my own, just my own edification, um, is I read about Solomon, because I was really intrigued by Solomon, and he seemed really smart, and I wanted to be smart, so I thought, maybe I should read about him. Oh, I'm getting flashed over here, flash of an image. Um, we have, oh my goodness, you guys, I almost forgot. We have new interns. What am I doing? <laughs> um, I just I got so ahead of myself thinking about wisdom that I didn't exhibit it as I was trying to talk about wisdom. And we have, we have a couple of new interns. One just arrived a couple of days ago. Another one has been here for a little bit longer than that. But I'm going to ask Nicholas to stand up, and Davida to stand up, please. <laughs> Nicholas is visiting us from Switzerland, and Davida from Italy, and uh, really, really happy to have you here, guys. It's really awesome. You can have a seat, David. Um, <laughs> it's really awesome to have our men's wing uh, in, in the campus be full, be pretty, pretty full. So if another guy intern comes, they might be sleeping on the floor. Who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's really awesome. It's kind of interesting to see how, you know, over time, like, we'll have a lot of girl interns, we'll have a lot of guy interns and kind of back and forth. But right now, we've got a really beautifully balanced full house here. And uh, it's just, it's great to have both of you guys. Okay, back to wisdom. <laughs> so I was intrigued by Solomon. I, I read his story because I just, I don't know, I didn't quite know how to put it into words at that time. I was quite young. Um, but I just, I, I longed for wisdom. I know now that's what was in my heart. I think at the time I didn't quite, I didn't quite know that. But the subject of wisdom, godly wisdom, um, is, is something that's, that I'm passionate about, not just because I have desired it in my life, but because God has given me wisdom, and the kind of fruit or the, the outcomes, the, the things that, that have happened in my life because of godly wisdom, um, I, I recognize this is, as the scriptures say that we're going to read this morning, this is incredibly valuable, worth desiring more than gold, riches, fame, favor among men. The desire of wisdom truly is a godly thing. And when we live our lives with a godly wisdom, stuff happens that would not otherwise happen. What I'm excited about this morning is um, I did, I did a, a Bible study in, in Proverbs about wisdom and I discovered some things that I didn't, I didn't know before, which is always fun. Um, but it helped put to words something that I have been struggling to describe to people. So that's why I'm so excited, because I, I'm hoping this is going to help you understand understanding. <laughs> I, I hope this is going to give you wisdom about wisdom to know what it is and what it is and what it is not. Okay. So we're going to read maybe all of Proverbs chapter 8. Maybe I'm going to paraphrase some of it. But first, I want to tell you about Proverbs chapter 9. Okay, we're going to, we got to, we got to get in there. Okay, so a couple of times in the book of Proverbs, um, most of the Proverbs were written by Solomon, the guy that I was so intrigued by. Um, 
And one of the literary devices that he uses, I know I'm losing some of you already, like, oh. Huh? Oh. Um, one of the literary devices that he uses is something called personification. He personifies wisdom as a woman who is crying out to male passersby. Now, what's interesting about that is the personification of wisdom is this woman who is crying out to people. But in Proverbs chapter 9, he also uses the same exact literary device to personify foolishness, also as a woman who is crying out to men who are passing by. And interestingly, and you can read this for yourself in Proverbs chapter 9, precisely the same language is used as the very first call to this guy who's passing by. Wisdom and foolishness use exactly the same language to try to encourage the person passing by to come and, and, and be with them. So specifically, it's, it says, this is Proverbs 9, verse 4, whoever is naive, let him turn and hear to him who lacks understanding. Wisdom says, come eat of my food, drink of the wine I have mixed, forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. Okay. Same thing about, about foolishness now. It says, the woman of folly, again, personifying foolishness, she says, Whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. It's, exa it's exactly the same language. To him who lacks understanding, foolishness says, stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But the man passing by does not know that the dead are there, and that her guests, the guests of foolishness, are in the depths of Sheol which is to say, hell. Y'all got real quiet. <laughs> um, that was kind of the inspiration for me wanting to look into this further, is that both wisdom and foolishness cry out to us in a very similar manner. So if that is true, how does a genuine person tell the difference between godly wisdom and foolishness, if what they're saying is kind of similar. If we expand this idea further, one of the things that I have noticed is that there's a temptation to take the wisdom that God would give us and put it almost on like an equal footing as, or the same playground as, other sources of wisdom, be it worldly wisdom, wisdom that you learned growing up, wisdom from school, wisdom from folks who have studied a subject for a long time. It's tempting in this day and age to put godly wisdom as sort of like one of many options of sources of wisdom to listen to when we are navigating some kind of thing in, in life. And so that's what really captured my attention, that godly wisdom, and I'll just say it broadly, not godly wisdom, both of them sound really similar to each other. Are you intrigued? Do you want to be able to tell the difference between godly wisdom and, uh, and foolishness? All right. For those of you who are like, I don't know, let me tell you <laughs> Proverbs chapter 8, the last two verses, okay, and I, I'd like you to read this if you have your Bible with you. So put your eyeballs on these two verses, verse 35 and 36 of Proverbs chapter 8. Again, this is personifying wisdom. He who finds me, meaning finding wisdom, because this is wisdom as if she were speaking, he who finds wisdom finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. It's a positive statement that feels like I would like life. That's good. Favor with God, also good. Verse 36, but he who sins against me injures himself. And all those who hate me, again, meaning wisdom, hate wisdom, 
Those who hate wisdom love death. The stakes are pretty high here, actually. And I think that's a part of the ruse, which is to say the, the trick, the, the deception, is, okay, yeah, there's godly wisdom, and you could probably learn something from the Bible. But then there's all these other wonderful sources of wisdom on basically equal footing as godly wisdom. And you kind of just, it's sort of like a buffet. You know, take a little bit from uh, godly wisdom, maybe take a little bit from Islam even. Maybe take a little bit from Buddhism, take a little bit from atheism, take a little bit from humanism. You know, you can put ism on the end of anything, and it kind of sounds fancy, like chairism, you know, the, the belief about chairs. I don't know. Just take what you want from different sources and construct a way of thinking about life that is suitable for you. That's kind of, I would say, one of the predominant ways of approaching life right now is, oh, cool, you want to dabble in Christianity? That's great. Dabble in other stuff, too. And find the mixture of ingredients that is suitable for your life because you are the only one that knows the best about your life. This is what the world says. And that sort of has a logic to it because you're the only one living your life. And so the idea that somebody else might know better about your life is like kind of offensive because I'm the one living my life. The problem with that is that ignores the fact that you're a created being with a design and a purpose. So you're actually not the one that knows the most about your life. It's your creator and designer who, who's the one who knows the most about your life. That's the problem with that way of thinking. It's also prideful. I'm having a really great time this morning. All right. So what is the substance of godly wisdom? How can we discern it and tell the difference between godly wisdom and not godly wisdom? So let's read in chapter 8. Let's start in, in verse number 1. Does not wisdom call, and understanding lift up her voice? On top of the heights, beside the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand, and beside the gates, at the opening to the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out. Point number one, godly wisdom is calling out to you, and it's basically wherever you are. <laughs> That's kind of the point of these, these few verses. She's on the heights. She's at the opening of the door. She's at the opening of the gate. She's like where you go. God has like put centuries of, of wisdom crying out to you as you're about to enter in a new phase of life, as you're going into class, as you're waking up in the morning, as you're on your way to work, as you're ending your day at work, wisdom is crying out to you, trying to make known to you what is godly wisdom. One of the lies out there is that wisdom is like nearly impossible to gain. And God is super mysterious I have no idea what he's saying, and I have no idea how to even hear from him. But these verses say otherwise. It says that God has set up like little stations of wisdom that overlap with where you are in life, and it's just crying out to you if you would learn how to listen. Godly wisdom is everywhere in everything that you do, crying out to you. This is the way. Walk in it. That encourages me. So what is she crying out with? Verse four, to you, O man, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. So again, remember, this is, a, this is a metaphor. This is a personification of wisdom as a woman, and it's a, it's a metaphor. So this isn't saying, like, this does not apply to women. The, the idea, if you would allow me a little bit of, a little bit of rope here, the idea is, like, what's going to capture a man's attention? A woman. That's going to capture its attention. It's okay. I think it's a little funny, right? Like, what's really going to get the attention of a man? A woman. So the point is, God knows how to make wisdom attractive and something that you want to pay attention to. You're all very like, <laughs> can he say that? Don't dare me to do a teaching on Song of Solomon. Do I need to go there? Okay. <laughs> wisdom is attractive. It captures your attention. You're walking by, minding your business, and you're like, whoa, wisdom. 
That's how it's supposed to be. But isn't it often the case where people are like, ugh, godly wisdom. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's, it's desirable. It's like, oh, when I hear you, when I see you, when I see what you're about, I want more. So by analogy, a man's like, whoa, let's go. <laughs> to you, oh, men, I call. The guy's like, yeah? And she says, oh, naive ones. So a little offensive, but still. <laughs> The man's like, you're still super attractive. <laughs> oh, naive ones, discern prudence. And oh, fools, discern wisdom. Listen, for I shall speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will produce right things. My mouth will utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness, and there is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. So these verses are communicating that godly wisdom is 100% free or, or absent of anything that is wicked, crooked, perverted, wrong, squirrely, uh, even, even silly. That's kind of the idea of foolishness is that you're just silly. You're, 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 you're a fool. Um, so godly wisdom is, it's pure. It's pure. And anything that is impure is not godly wisdom. Remember Proverbs chapter 9 when it says, the woman of folly cries out and says, ah, stolen bread is sweet. Uh, it, that, that, that is a statement that is being made about the value or the desirability of something that is, is wrong. It's crooked. It's stolen. Foolishness says, ah, but that's sweet. In fact, the fact that it's stolen makes it even more exciting and makes it even sweeter. But wisdom, godly wisdom, is pure. So that can't be true that stolen bread is sweet because that is impure. So that's one of the ways where you can discern between something that might sound or look similar but is actually quite different is this pathway that's being presented to me completely pure. Because if it's not, it's not godly wisdom. This applies to things at work. Maybe when you want to cut a corner, cut a corner, it's not going to hurt anyone. Godly wisdom is completely absent of anything that is crooked. Or impure. So we don't cut corners. That's not godly wisdom. Ever. All right? So that's probably not going to blow your mind. If you had to guess, if I, gave you, if I gave you a test, is godly wisdom pure or impure? I bet most of you would have nailed that test. Okay. But, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, verse 10. Wisdom says, take my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choicest gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. I'm going to read the last phrase again. All desirable things cannot compare with wisdom. So anytime you are tempted to want something more than godly wisdom, that's, it's off. That's crooked. It's, it's perverse. It's, it's not the way that God intended. We were designed to want to know the way that God wants us to live our lives. Like that's in your spiritual DNA, so to speak. So anytime you can tell that your tastes, your desires are leaning away from godly wisdom, there's something going on there. There's something going on there. Um, the, the contrast is very important here because of a, some verses we're going to read later that the prosperity gospel folks, I think, take out of context. But it's pretty clear here, right, that wisdom is like, take my instruction rather than riches, rather than the things that the world knows how to value, Silver, jewels, gold, fame, uh, being, 
yeah, I don't know, being popular. Those things, do not choose those things over wisdom. First choose wisdom, even if it means rejecting silver, jewels, things that are valuable in the world. All right, I'm going to come back to that. Here's where my mind was blown. Verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. Okay. Sounds like a very exciting house with interesting roommates. <laughs> okay. I want to I tell you what these words mean, because it's probably not what you think that they mean. At least it wasn't what I thought. So wisdom, that's a little bit straightforward. Um, dwell with prudence. What does prudence mean? In the Hebrew, prudence means craftiness, shrewdness, cleverness, or literally trickery. So if I gave you a poll this morning, I said, is godly wisdom trickery or not trickery? Probably you would have chosen not trickery, right? So what's up with that? Knowledge, wisdom says, I find knowledge. Knowledge means cunning, or that you're like awares, like aware of, you have an awareness, you understand things. Discretion means purpose, direction, or like literally like plotting. Like plotting, you know? Plotting. Hmm. Devices. That's what that word means. So what's up with that? <laughs> that sounds kind of like the picture of like your, your prototypical villain, you know? Like one does these things in a lair, you know what I mean? <laughs> like if you're in a cave that you made for yourself that nobody knows about, that's where you do these things. Trickery, plotting, things like that. So how can we understand this? Well, we have to do a whole Bible study. We have to remember that godly wisdom also is completely absent of anything crooked, perverse, wicked, anything that's not right or not straightforward. So how do we understand these things? This is how I hope I can explain to you. If you took cunning not trickery in the sense where you're, like, you're trying to like trick someone, but just the idea that you're so clever, you are such an expert at kind of figuring out how to plan and calculate and purpose yourself to succeed in life. If you took that skill set and you took out of it every single thing that would be wicked about it, that's godly wisdom. Godly wisdom helps you expertly navigate everything in life as if it could be said about you that you are cunning you're a, you're masterful about how you navigate life and someone would look at your life and be like how did you do that i mean how did you know to pursue that thing at work how did you know how to raise your kids that way how did you know to turn that opportunity down and instead wait over here? Because it just seems like your level of strategy is like next level. And the person who has lived by godly wisdom, their answer is very simple. It's wisdom that comes from the Lord. Not a, I don't get the sense from this that it's some sort of like mysterious wisdom. You know, this isn't some like, like sage, you know, in a robe somewhere, like coming up with some sort of arcane wisdom. This describes the kind of person who knows how to take the unexpecteds in life, the things that are adverse or difficult or confusing, and yet still they are able to navigate those things expertly because they have engaged with godly wisdom. One of the things that I'm concerned about as a, as a pastor is that folks would, folks would take advice like use the Bible to help you navigate life, and they say, well, I can't find a verse about this. So 
I guess the Bible doesn't say anything about that. That is like a holistic misunderstanding of the way that godly wisdom works. Yes, sometimes there is literally a verse that spells out precisely for you this. But I would say even the majority of things that you and I face simply require godly wisdom that is informed by the, 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 the spirit, the, the wisdom, the guidance, the boundaries that we find in scriptures rather than a specific, if this, then do that. And that, friends, is actually mindless. What this is advocating for is mindful. And that, that's literally what naive means. It means simple-minded or open-minded, as if the thoughts come in and they go immediately right out because there's nowhere to land inside. And so... <laughs> By the way, that's how you start life. If you don't believe that, then you should work in CM in the toddler age, and they're just not a lot of opportunity for thoughts to land in there and take residence. So they just kind of do their thing. That's the picture of you and me. You are, as I am, naive. But wisdom cries out to us and says, come be with me, and I will show you how to masterfully and expertly navigate life, not by being mindless, but by being mindful of the things that are true and right and straightforward. And then with those things, you can plot and plan and expertly, yeah, figure out how to navigate these things by the Spirit of God and by His truth. Oh, we got to go on. Oh my gosh, we got to go on. Okay, there's other things that wisdom says. Verse 14. Counsel is mine, and sound wisdom, I am understanding, and power is mine. That caught my attention. <laughs> I highlighted this. This is one of the first verses I ever highlighted. I'm like, power? <laughs> that sounds like something I want. <laughs> power is mine, so I would like to have wisdom. I didn't really know what that meant. That just, I don't know. Maybe it's because I was the youngest sibling or something. I'm like, yes, power is mine. <laughs> Okay, when it says, though, counsel is mine, do you know what that implies? You need counsel. Your own wisdom, your own thoughts, your own understanding will not capacitate you to expertly navigate this life. It won't. You need counsel. Where are you getting counsel from? Pro tip, you are getting counsel from somewhere right now. You might not realize it, but you are 100% listening to some other source beside yourself to make decisions in life. What are those sources of counsel? Godly wisdom says counsel is, is mine. Sound wisdom. <laughs> I love this. I can't even believe it. It means efficient wisdom. If there's something that drives me in life besides my love for Jesus Christ, it's efficiency. Like, I hate walking, like, in a round. I want to go straight there. Like, let's just get to it. Things that unnecessarily take a long time drive me nuts. That's why I don't like making beds. You want to know why? You're going to mess it up tonight. So it's 100% unnecessary. <laughs> we decided that a made bed looks good, but what if we decide an unmade bed looks good? Then <laughs> folding laundry, same thing. You know what you do with laundry? You don't wear it folded. You wear it on you. So why are we folding it? It is unnecessary. <laughs> this is biblical, people. <laughs> Sound wisdom. Don't fold your clothes or make your bed. You heard it here first. <laughs> Oh, man. Do we have any high schoolers in here? All right. They would love this one. <laughs> I am understanding power is mine. What does power mean? I'm going to tell you. Strength, might, force, mastery. This is not painting the picture of some helpless, mindless, boneless, clueless Christian. Just like, I'm going to... No. Masterful. Strength, might, valor, bravery. That's what that word means. When you employ godly wisdom, it capacitates you to be brave, make difficult decisions that are right, even though it might seem adverse to you or it might seem like it disadvantages you, but you know that it is right. And because you know that it is right, godly wisdom will help you navigate whatever fallout there might be because you made a decision that was right. That's how we live our lives wisely. 
All right, oh my gosh. All right, 15. By me, kings reign. I feel like that speaks for itself. Verse 18. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield than choicest silver. Verse 21. Wisdom endows those who love wisdom with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. All right, it's verse 21 that I want to pick on a little bit. I think some people have read that. They're like, oh, godly wisdom. You know, if I follow the Bible, I'm going to get rich. But like, what is all the stuff that we just read? That wisdom is better than gold. So if you think that verse is about a get rich quick scheme, you're totally missing the point. However, I will say that when you live your life wisely by God's design, you do live, I'm just going to call it broadly, a successful life. Now, that success might not be the way that the world considers success. So I'm not saying that you're going to be like the best performer in your workplace. But I will say that if you follow the wisdom that is in the scripture, it will make you a better worker, no matter what your job is. Um, and the thing that I, I circled in there was enduring wealth. And how many other places in the Bible does it talk about beauty or wealth is fleeting? It means it's here for a little bit and then it's gone. It's the stock market thing, like, I made a bunch of money. Oh my gosh, the market's crashing. That's money in a nutshell. But when we follow wisdom's call, we take in ourselves a wealth, so to speak. We are enriched in a way that isn't as flimsy or temporal as cash, money, wealth. There is an enriching of your life when you live it God's way. All right, verses 22 through 31 Oh, man, gosh, it's so good. Just read it. Would you just read it, okay? When you go home, just read it. Basically, this is wisdom saying, like, all right, you still don't believe me? She says, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. And then it says, yeah, when creation was made, God held me in his hand as a masterful workman working on God's behalf to create the world. So this is like a resume. Wisdom's like, oh, you want to know what I've done in the past? I've made the earth. I mean, God used me to make creation. So if you want to understand the fruit or the outcome of godly wisdom, like what gets produced out of that, you need look no further than the abundant life and the mastery of the calculated heavenlies to discern what happens when you live your life wisely? That's what it means when it says you will find life if you live God's way. It's not so pathetic as cash. You know, Saturn looks at money and it's like, what? Saturn doesn't care how much money you have. Electrons don't care how many houses you own. The, the, the wonder of creation, that's what's available to us when we live God's way. Verse 32, she says, Now, therefore, now that you know my resume, O sons, listen to me. For blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts, for he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself, and all those who hate me love death. That's the last thing I'm going to say about this. Notice the inversion of the roles from the beginning of this proverb to the end. In the beginning... Who was seeking whom? Wisdom was seeking you. But in the end, it says, if you really want to engage in this, you must become the seeker of wisdom. 
So instead of wisdom waiting for you, now you're waiting for wisdom at wisdom's gates, at wisdom's doorposts, waiting, seeking, praying, searching, asking, receiving counsel. That is how you become wise, and you will be blessed as a result. You will find life and favor from the Lord. I love wisdom. This is like biblical dispensation to use your brain and navigate life according to God's way, his straightforward right way, but you'll be blessed as a result. Well, we're going to come to the Lord's table this morning. And uh, yeah, there's so many things that are given to us because of what Jesus Christ did. That's what this moment is about is remembering the, the power, is remembering the, the capacity that God has given us because he died on the cross. And salvation from our sins is certainly a massive part of it. But as we read in Proverbs, there's also other things that are available to us besides salvation. Wisdom is one of those things. I just want to say to anybody here who doesn't have a relationship with God, this could be the moment. In fact, you could come up and grab the bread and grab the cup as a statement saying, I believe that Jesus, you died for me, and so I'm going to partake in that. I believe that your blood was shed for me. You take of the cup as a way of saying, I believe and I repent. Be my Lord, be my guide. And you can do that as you come back to your seat. We're going to take communion row by row, and so ushers are going to dismiss you, and uh, we'll take it one at a time. Okay, here we go.